Right. And why do you think is that important? Why do you think does it matter for the environment what the um, pressures are, what the temperature is, and how the winds? And basically, what you're saying is what you need to get my hair to the temperature, temperature changes to make it. So, you need to get your temperature. Awesome. I mean, thank you for looking up the videos. It's a third video. Basically, when I gave you the videos, it's because, you know, I, as a child, I used to look at the weather forecasts and only to know what the weather is going to be like. But then when I started my undergrad and we were told that air and the wind dilutes the, the uh, pollution, for example, from the industry. So it, an industry could just get rid of all the pollution that it's throwing into the atmosphere because it's super windy and then it's out of sight, out of mind. And that's exactly what happens given the water pollution as well. Like. We always thought that dilution was the solution. That is not the case anymore. Whether the forecasts are important for us to plan our days, our activities, but it's also more important to understand when it's going to rain and how that rain will then impact your food security or how that rain will then impact the water flows in the rain. And what should that mean for us to plan our cities well? So there's a lot of information that we get there, particularly I think with the environment, um, with reference to climate change. Basically, long-term weather events are climate, climatic events. So if there are small changes in the weather, for example, the more humid air you can see, you know, when you read on a mobile, it is 33, but it feels like 43 because there's a lot of moisture content in the air. That's an information that we need to have. Now imagine if one two years plan it, it gets warmer and the moisture content in the atmosphere increases. What is that going to mean for individuals? Who then live in that condition. So I think, in a way, it also helps us understand how the weather is changing and how that weather then leads to climatic events because more moisture content, of course, of course, means more heat. And then, you know, the weather patterns are just so um, difficult now to, to understand and predict because there are you know, all of these flash floods, sudden droughts. They're not making sense to scientists. And the third video basically was about the, um, I don't know how many of you heard of it, the IPCC Skyward Report, um, the International Council of Change. Um, they basically, the, all the scientist community comes together and writes what's going on around the world, for people to be informed, for policy makers to be informed. And this this time around, the report I think last month basically said that we've already reached the tipping point. And it's called red for the planet. And you must have seen it in a lot of places. It's called red for the planet, which basically means that we can no longer just ignore it. We have to act and we have to act right? Right. So just um, just an understanding of what we want to do there. And hopefully but past the pilot, I also wanted to. Um, show you this, which is some people, of course, had problems with understanding the question, which meant that they could not calculate the power in 2020, uh, which is all right. And, and although this is an information that might seem too much to you, but it basically just tells you what the, I don't know if I'm able to operate this, it basically tells you, it basically tells you what the contribution of every country is in terms of per capita of the outside. Pakistan is somewhere here and here, whereas India is here. And then, you know, if you look at all the developed countries, that's the contribution that they make and in terms of CO2 per capita because of the affluent societies that they have. Um, but then the, the fun part is that, you know, we can go on and blame all the countries. We can even go on and blame them. So I can make you be as guilty as I want in this class. But the truth is that most of the uh, emissions actually come from people who are the top 20% of this world in terms of wealth. It's the few powerful people who hold all of these industries that um, contribute to the 
And if you've seen a lot of videos, uh, you know, some of these viral videos, they keep saying the top 100 companies are, are the companies that contribute the most uh, to greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. Um, so all of the, this, you know, of course, every, every division has a role to play because together we are seven million people and if one person triggers the action and it goes up to seven million people, that means that seven million people just learn to live consciously. But when we tell people, um, and you know, and the average is very, so it is important for you to see in the class that even if our country average is low, you could be living an average that is equivalent of the developed world. So that would tell you your individual. So as a country, we are poor. As a country, our footprint is um, low, but an individual could still have high So I think it's, it's just about interpreting those, uh, those ideas. And I think we all need to have mind. So I can just start with. Um, this concept, which is energy, because I think all of the atmosphere-related discussion comes down to electromagnetic variations. And you would have seen all those variations that hit the ground and then some of it's reflected, some of it is stopped at the top atmosphere layer, and then only some of it is able to come. But before I talk about electromagnetic radiations, I thought maybe to be worth also telling you uh, what um, energy is. So energy is you know, the ability to do what? Capacity to do what so force and distance. So when I move from let's say here to here, I'm spending energy, and that energy is basically the chemical energy found into so kinetic energy. So from static energy to you know, kinetic energy. So just that kind of information. So for example, in dams, we have stored energy, that's the uh, potential energy or the static energy. And then if you move it, so if the turbines move. Electricity is generated, that's your kind of energy. Uh, but we'll come back to this discussion later. I think, with reference to atmosphere, electromagnetic radiations and heat, which are one form of energy, are most important. So I, I just wanted to start there for you to think. Again. Sorry, that's a good idea. I have to just come back again to this. Okay, and I'm sure that you remember it from your basic sciences. Courses where they told you these are all the radiations that are coming from the sun. Most of them are stopped in the topmost layer of the atmosphere. Uh, you do not need to be worried about the terms. If you just look at this, um, it will basically show you that the wavelengths are longer and the cycles have decreased. So longer wavelengths, lower frequency, right? Lower, lower cycle per second, but that also means that lower edge. So on this side of the electromagnetic radiations, there's lower energy, lower frequency, uh, but longer wavelengths. And if you look at the other side, which is the gamma rays, X rays, which you're also aware of, when we hear a lot, I don't know, when someone's coming to the hospital, it's shorter wavelengths, but it's higher energy and frequency. And, and it's important to know this because people will now tell you the UV, more, more UV radiations are able to cross the ozone layer and reach the ground. That means these are now wavelengths that are shorter, that have high frequency and high energy, and they'll have the ability to, let's say, damage some of the plant crosses. Um, you know, skin cancer is often related to it. So this, this particular line is, is way more important than it seems at the moment. And it, the functions are not just bad. For example, most of what you see on top are their good functions. So how we use those properties uh, to take something out that's good for us. Uh, but then the most important is this, is what we see right now, which is the visible light. And this light is not just white. It's actually divided into these. So if you remember those, those color codes from your childhood, again, what's worth remembering is where the energy is high, where the wavelengths are high, and where, where the frequency is low. And the colors that we see in our, like right now, the colors that we've seen is basically the color that any object is reflecting. So the green is the green being reflected and every other color in here being absorbed. So that it's also like an interesting way to look at how environment manifests itself within those color schemes, right? 
Um, so yeah, just just a reminder. And then why is that important? And I hope that all of you have studied what greenhouse effect is or what global warming is and what climate change is. How would you define it? Anyway. Yes. Yes. The greenhouse gases are gases that are mainly carbon based and absorb heat, have the ability to absorb heat. Um, but what about the ozone layer? Awesome. So the, the, the uh, atmosphere essentially is a blanket of gases on a fire. Whereas uh, the ozone layer is that layer outside of the ground. So I'll show you the layers of the atmosphere and where ozone is based. It essentially stops all of those, um, those in that electromagnetic radiation, a lot of it's not healthy for the planet or the earth. It kind of reflects it back into the atmosphere. Um, and so, you know, the ozone layer, of course, is it, it, it is called O3. It oxygen molecule reacts with another oxygen, very reactive in the atmosphere, and forms this blanket that doesn't allow for a lot of things to pass through. So let's say this is the ozone layer, then it means most of what's passing through is the visible light, the light that we get to see and the colors that we get to see. It's essentially that. But some of the, for example, UV radiation, which are close to the visible light, so we saw UV on the other side and infrared on this side. Some of the other layers also um, get to pass through some of the other radiations. And infrared is all right, even some of the visible light that is absorbed is then reflected as as infrared. So you know that's normal, that's that's how things have always been. Um, and that is okay because some of the heat is absorbed. If, if you remember life is um life exists on this planet because the temperature is maintained, which is not something that the other planets have. That's that's what we saw how the temperatures are maintained in the day. Um, but then how does that change the um, the environment? And before we get to that, before we get to the layers. Um, the information on just what the atmosphere contains is that most of it is nitrogen. So remember when we talked about origin of the Earth, we talked about how hydrogen and the first ones, and then eventually more elements were formed. Now the current composition of atmosphere that is taught in the box is that most of it, which is this on the pie chart, is around 17% is nitrogen. 21% is oxygen, which is the most important for us to have, and only 1% is all the other gases, and some of them I have to mention. And I've highlighted a few uh, that contribute to, to climate change. Now, the thing is, some of these are important, right? We talked about essential nutrients. Some of the trace nutrients are important. Others are important to maintain the temperature. Carbon dioxide is, a, is actually important for autotrophs. Um, and methane is important to maybe uh, naturally if it existed and it kept the temperature. Uh, but the little changes that we're making in the atmosphere is also now changing the temperature of the Earth. So let's get back to where the ozone is. So ozone, like I said, um, in the presence of uh, UV, oxygen reacts, oxygen molecules react with each other, and then ozone is highly reactive and it's like a reverse reaction, which we need. In this layer is also called uh, ozonosphere. So it's troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. But then this layer, which is called the ozonosphere, is the layer which is of importance when it comes to UV radiations and it comes to transmitting some of the harmful radiations back to the earth. And I just I like this image better because then it gives us the sense of the um, And you know, and if you also look at the temperatures where um, so a lot of what's maintained here, um, it, it then goes down and then goes up and then goes down and then goes down and so on. Um, but look at how feasible life that's only here because of all of these gases, all of that blanket that is condensed close to the surface of Earth because of uh, uh, the gravitational forces that exist. 
So anyways, up until now, do you guys have any questions? Yes. One not not a lot. Um, yeah, but I think some of some of these then end up augmenting the discipline, but a lot of it has no role, uh, but they impact the composition of the atmosphere. So I think they create that right to balance. For, for, for the atmosphere and their role isn't involved, it's not manipulative, meaning it's not talking about. So it, it doesn't like they're not paid, given a lot of attention. But but I think every the composition is important because if they remember the the bioindicators that practically had little role but were indicating how healthy the atmosphere is. So I think these two are like the bioindicators that that we get every still in that that their concentrations are balanced, that the atmospheric energy and chemical flow is balanced. But in terms of like active role, they don't have a lot. Okay. But some of these um, gases are essential to the process of the Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, now we talked about ozone. Of course, you, you know what ozone thinning or ozone hole is. Um, so we said in the stratosphere, there is a layer of ozone. And that layer stops thermal radiations from coming to the ground, and it's important for the well-being of the life here. So, really, really important, a very important role of ozone in the stratosphere. And stick with that because we'll also go to another role of ozone later in the lecture. But essentially, like if you look at the power Antarctica, then it's thinning, um, which means more UV radiations are used. Planet, which means they're more reactive, which means you know, more melting will take place in temperatures will rise. And all of that we happen, we say is happening because the greenhouse gases are increasing. Um, generally, carbon dioxide is used as an indicator of greenhouse gases. We'll, we'll talk about the others in a bit. But CO2 is used as an indicator. Uh, and if you look at it between uh, the 1880, which is when we started observing it, to um, 2000. Uh, the, the values are just increasing incrementally, and I think that's where most of the climate scientists think that the problem is, that we're just increasing the amount which means more heat trapping, which means more moisture, which means more droughts, which means more rains, and then, you know, everything is just reflected in the climate change data. When I was at your level, a lot of the discussion used to happen around uh, CFCs, so maybe I should know something. So, for example, for us, um, the like they used to tell us that, and, and at that time, all the refrigerators had uh, chlorofluorocarbons as a, as a coolant. So, so CFC, and then at that time, they also um, then replaced this with HCFCs, and then also some of that was replaced with HFCs. So basically, and if you if you remember the periodic table, it's in terms of reactivity, it's chlorine, chlorine, bromine, iron. So like this is more reactive. And when this reactive one, so like chlorofluorocarbons, was basically more reactive. And when it hit the ozone layer, um, if you, this used to hit it, it meant that it would now break the ozone back to oxygen. So ozone is no longer ozone anymore. And it's not doing, doing its job anymore. So then we replaced it with, replaced it with um, instead of chloro, like hydrochlorocarbons. So chlorine, because it was less reactive compared to chlorine, we, we said we've done some work with the planet. Now the coolants are being replaced. But I think a lot of what we've sent to the atmosphere still lies there. And that's the problem with most of the environment. When you get to the wire persistent, they just live there. Chlorine, chlorine, chlorine atom is still Now, if you can't guess that, <laughs> can you? Chlorine, chlorine, chlorine atom is still Okay. Okay, fine. Like, I don't know. I mean, maybe if I'm messing it up. 
Okay, iodine has to be. Okay, so at any case, like these are most reactive gases that are there, and they are going to degrade the uh, the ozone layer. Yes. Well, 
but then this is the time when it's big because it has the highest size. Um, and so, like, what I wanted to say is when you really make sure you're not just creating it, like, you know, when go with heaven and say awesome, I think awesome was, wasn't it creating. Uh, it was just, I think, different time. Yeah. yeah, actually, a lot of other religions were increasing in, in number. So, again, don't be intimidated by this. It's just a pie chart uh, without some of the noble gas information, but the major gases. So, remember the, uh, the ozone which is now, if you look at the environmental modes, it will tell you top, toxic, right? So remember the important role that it plays in the stratosphere, and then now I, uh, if you look at the books, it will tell you that this role is toxic. So just, just keep that there. But for example, nitrogen we say is important. So we, we can come back to the last question now. M2 is an art. The nitrogen is important for all that. So when we look at the nitrogen cycle, it will tell us how we then get nitrogen back to life, which is important. So how it then contributes and how that is fixed. So we don't really like it is non-reactive or noble, but then we the electric lights and tender we do convert it to nitro nitrous oxide, which are important for the nitrogen cycle, which is important for life on our planet. So yeah, so some of these like what is important for life. Um, and what their importance in the environment. And by environment, I mean the environment that we live in, not the stratosphere, right? Okay, so just keep that in, in mind. And I, I wanted to introduce you to these terms because these terms will come up again and again. So the first was what we learned in last class, which is point sources of pollution and not point sources of pollution. So we know exactly where the pollution is coming from, and sometimes we have to trace it back. So, for example, over in Antarctica, if there is any pollutant, because there was no life form before, there was no human intervention before, we have to go back and see what the source of that case was. Um, whereas for the factory that's right next to my home, I would be able to tell, yes, that's the source of pollution that's coming, or the suit that is coming, and such and so on. So the point and not point of pollution. But then in terms of climate and atmosphere, I think the, um, the uh, non-point source of pollution are also important, but then the natural anthropogenic is because I will continue to put the blame on um, human intervention in, in pollution, uh, but there are also a lot of natural resources or sources of some of these. So a lot of people will um, tell us, uh, specifically climate deniers will tell you that all of this was being produced by natural sources anyway. So for example, when there are forest fires, if there isn't complete burning, then that means that carbon monoxide will be released from there. So for example, cows already um, emit methane gas. So that's, you know, those are natural sources, but they're not anthropogenic sources. So a lot of people will come to that and tell you that these sources exist naturally. But then there are other anthropogenic sources, which I think are important for our task, which is how are we increasing all of these pollutants? How are we contributing to them by creating all the resources that we, we are creating for ourselves? And how incomplete combustion or wastefulness or extra fossil fuel burning is contributing to most of the uh, sources of air pollutants? The other is primary air pollutants and secondary air pollutants. So I told you that ozone layer is in this environment, that it, it, the air that will be a toxic material um, like this. But it's a secondary pollutant. It doesn't naturally exist on the troposphere. Um, it, does, it did exist, but in very short, uh, small quantities. But with our intervention, with the anthropogenic sources, we have now started creating these secondary pollutants, which is some elements reacting with the others to create toxic compounds. So primary pollutants are the one that are released to the atmosphere directly. That's the CO2. The second pollutant could be, for example, um, H2SO4 that is formed in the atmosphere when uh, sulfur dioxide reacts with water. So that is your, um, uh, your second pollutant. I had a question. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So for example, even though those natural resources are increasing in number because of the anthropogenic sources. So the drier periods, which then start with forest fires are one reason. And by the way, a lot of these forest fires are also um, human induced. So all of this timber mafia, this, this uh, food security and clearing the land, we use it for agriculture. All of this is also in play, but I think a lot of the forest fires happen naturally as well. I have a friend in the US who says that um, this season, like when the forest fires start, they call it the, uh, uh, the fire season, right? the, forest, the wildfire season. So the fact that we've already added another artificial season into our, our lives because they're now so frequent is that, uh, you know, we're, we are partly responsible to it, but also like this is now with the calendar for some of those people living in, the, in that ecosystem would look like, like the dry and get to the more fires there will be. And we just have to, I think, be prepared to uh, to stop the wildfires. And we have lost, we've lost so much in the past two, three years. It's uh, it's quite sad in terms of wildfires, forest fires in Uh Okay. How much time do I have? Right. So let's look at the air pollutants uh, right now, and I'll just highlight a few. Um, first, carbon dioxide. Carbon oxides, I, I said because I also mentioned carbon monoxide in the same category. The nitrogen oxides, then sulfur oxide, uh, because I'll also try and bring this acids here as well. Ozone is, like I said, in the troposphere. A pollutant. And then volatile organic compounds, which is some of these. What I thought you had a question. Okay, so ozone and then volatile organic compounds, again, which are released naturally into the atmosphere, such as um, acetone, is a, is a volatile uh, organic compound, right? Because it's, when you put it somewhere, it also evaporates. It's volatile, it's released. Yeah. So if you allow it to be, it will disappear um, in some time. So those kinds of compounds are called volatile organic compounds because they're organic in nature. But let's just stay there and quickly um, go to the first category, which is compounds of carbon that we call air pollutants because they have a lot of air. So, uh, and, and I think one thing that I like for people to remember is that. Most of them are colorless and cortex. Um, so the, the air doesn't always have to stink or the air doesn't always have to look uh, bad for it to be toxic. Because all of these gases are colorless and odorless, which means it is this air that contains the, the pollutant. And, and this clean, clear air is not an indication of air. Um, so just like um, a reminder. Anyway, so all of this, you know, we'll get to as well, like I said, the exhausts from the fuel, the uh, industrial states, the burning of fossil fuel, all of that, wherever there, wherever there's complete combustion, CO2 will be released, but whenever there's incomplete combustion, carbon dioxide will be released. And all of that has negative impact on the, either the planet or our health. Um, and the health is as you can see. So, for example, if, if someone, you know, you, and you must have heard this, that when people, in order to freeze their homes, keep it very tight, um, then a lot of these uh, gases do end up uh, building in the, in the atmosphere. And people say that, oh, we fainted it because, you know, there was no ventilation. That's actually building up on some of these uh, gases, which is not good for us. So just a reminder on those. And then quickly, the same thing that you were saying, if you look at how uh, carbon dioxide, which is an indicator for a greenhouse gas, it's not the only greenhouse gas, started building up. Um, the temperature also started rising. And if you look at the parts, so, so do remember this number as well, of how much the uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide has released from 1960 up to 2019, which was when the last data was uh, for this picture. And again, don't forget what it's like. 
and all the worst of its forms is natural, but that slight imbalance that we create with our input is um, true use of uh, fossil fuels is something that's the impact of the erosion. So for small, uh, you, you get 700 ppm of what? So I, I'll explain smog in a bit. Smog is not just one compound. Smog is a combination of compounds. And for smog, probably visibility would be one factor that would just generally reflect it. But if you say, for example, 700 ppm, then you also have to tell me 700 ppm of what? Uh, because I wouldn't know exactly what compound you're talking about. And we'll get to that. But then how many compounds could there be um, when small is small? So, so just hold that thought there. And yeah, so, so carbon dioxide, I think, is very simple. So what I really love, uh, for example, and, and I keep telling you this, is when you go abroad, all this information that's thrown at you and all the, um, all the awareness that's in there so, for example, our Oxford buses had this information, and I know it's not very clear here, but essentially what it's saying is that we have cleaned the fuel, and the fuel now has less nitrogen um, or nitric oxide emission, which means that less polluted emission. So your fossil fuel contains concentrations of sulfur and nitrogen whose oxides are then not good environment. So we already know that nitrogen oxides, which we generally call noxes, are not good for the environment. And noxes are released because the fossil fuels contain them and when they oxidize, they create the pollutant on the top scale. Um, but yeah, so for example, it, it will tell you here how it's released. We'll discuss it in a little detail when we study the nitrogen cycle. So I'll not bring that one here. But essentially that N2 in the air can convert into NO uh, or N2O or NO2. And all of them then, one of them can convert to a nitric oxide, which is HNO3. Um, and all of them have uh, impacts on our health on this planet. Um, and and you, know, you can see the sources. Uh, they're, they're, they're mostly, like most of them come from fossil paper, if you ask me, in terms of anthropogenic sources. Yes, Snap those catalytic inverters in use for both of nitrogen oxides released from exhaust yeah. of cars. Yes, yes. So there are two ways to, to look at it. Like I said, you can control the source. So for example, you can control the fuel that, that contains it, or you can control at, it at the output. So one way is to give the uh, bus clean fuel, and the other way is to put these. So most of the cars that are, that are now being made definitely come with Converters. So they can't make sure that, you know, for example, carbon monoxide is not released and, and only CO2 is released because CO is then a pollutant or, or, or other life. Well, carbon dioxide is still a greenhouse gas and it still affects the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why then the ultimate solution is to stop using fossil fuels. So, you know, and, and again, depends on how far we want to go on the top three. Like, so some of it, of course, you know, the fossil fuel is carbon um, based. So we will have carbon dioxide no matter what we do. Like that's going to be the final product, but it's still better than methane and carbon dioxide, at least for us. Because we can capture it on the planet. We can capture it by planting trees, you know, and then on those ways for the others, we have to make sure that we get rid of the heat pollution, which is why they put to it. Yes. How, how does that work biologically? Yeah, so I would say, for example, um, nitrogen oxide. So nitric oxide could maybe convert into HNO2 because it reacts with the water in your eyes um, and then cause itchiness in the eye. So every element will do something that will then impact the, the skin on the body. But I think that for 
most of them they react with moisture. They try and find, find moisture and react with moisture and then cause the irritation because that's the easiest way for them to uh, react. Does, does that answer the question? Awesome. So, and then sulfur dioxide again, like noxes, we just put them in the category of softness. Yes. At this point, I do think it's very, very obvious because the Google is working really, really, really hard. And even if someone isn't very like educated or even if someone hasn't had that like a lot of research in this field, it's going to be something obvious over that like three years back. So why aren't the governments prioritizing like switching to remote Yeah. 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 Can we say a little louder? We didn't get to this. We have said that we are not managing to do the thing. Maybe that's not funny for the government to do that because instead of working and maintaining the wind turbine, it costs a lot of money. And as part of the FDR, And please do say your names. Uh, the question that was asked from there, can I, can I have your name? Hanya. Okay, Hanya. And Okay, so um, that is the, these are all very valid points. And then now you see how complicated it gets. It gets. First of all, it's not about telling people and government things are harmful. Only that information is not enough. Only the science is not enough, right? Because governments are not doing anything. And governments are not doing anything for systems of equity that do not benefit the governments or the populations. So now everything is running on top. So maintaining to change that would mean changing everything in the system, either bringing those hybrid cars or vehicles or whatever you think is comes with the energy resources. Right? That is a huge commitment. Who, like which one of our leaders is ready to make it, this commitment when a system, no matter how inefficient it is, is already built? Um, and you will understand it when you try to make the little change more effective, you know, but sometimes you want to give up that stuff. Then you just go and sit in the market and say, I wouldn't be buying anything. So that comes to, you know, economically what is feasible for the government. Um, and you know, what are the steps? So a lot of the developed world, if you see, is now converting all of it. But then that is also really tricky. Because a lot of their old cars either end up in junkyards, you know, they have an impact of their own. So taking all of that creative material which had a carbon footprint water footprint to a junkyard and then telling the world that we're now switching to this and using a lot of industrial processes to create that is also very cute. So now you start looking at how difficult the conversion is and what would be the footprint of going clean because that would also then cost us a lot of waste and how would we get rid of that? And if you see some of the, the changes, how the developed world get rid of Let's rid of it is it sends all of its waste to us. All of its waste growth comes to us. All of its waste plastic comes to developing countries. And then uh, you were saying that technology isn't fully there. Like there are still flaws in the system. I think to that I would say yes, absolutely. But it's improving with time. So not using a, a car with a catalytic converter because it's not fully efficient. Um, versus using a car with catalytic converter because it's still reducing 50% of the pollutant, I think it's still a better call than not doing it. So, you know, we were talking about the little steps that we need today. Yes. 
Yeah, yeah, go ahead. But you have to get it to loud now. Or I can have to give you the voice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying that just looking at things is not enough. You want us to go more. Yeah, I like I, I said in the very beginning that you know it's it's difficult because uh, we we did say that the top computers and the top part computers are X Y Z people and companies and rich families and stuff. But all of us also are playing. Um, and I have problems with both networks. When people are made to feel guilty about what they produce, um, and we are shamed into like living a very minimal life, that's also not a true argument. But when only corporates are blamed, who runs the corporations? We do, right? We buy their products. So if we look at our footprint and we stop consuming some of those products, automatically the corporations will have to shift. If we tell the corporation, I don't, I don't want to buy XYZ product in plastic package anymore, and if the, if the entire city decides it, they will find a way to replace it because their value chains have already been existed. For them, it's a mere change in packaging. But for me, as a responsible person, it's, it's like driving somewhere, finding that organic store, and finding that, you know, it's, it's possible. How many of us can afford to do that? So yes, one only looking at one is not enough, but it does and what's your name again? So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. so you know when I said cleaning the fuel, cleaning the fuel essentially is getting rid of all those all of those traces that will oxidize the found in the troposphere. And um, basically, sulfur is so there's a lot of chemistry behind it, but the process is called smelting. So you use heat, and then based on heat, kind of characterize the base element. Um, so and, and smelting is just one process. There could be a lot of other processes to uh, define a compound, and that you know that that's a whole uh, chemistry. There's a whole chemistry behind it, but smelting is essentially applying heat to make sure that. From that board, you um, just take the base input. And similarly for fossil fuels, taking all of the extra material out and only keeping, let's say, the liquid nitrogen gas or the liquid petroleum gas, only that would be cleaning it to get rid of these extra things that you get out. Yes, maybe. Do you think the problem is also um, prioritization? I don't know how much of this course is going to be helped to be able to do it. Do you like how all of these countries just wanted to be able to exist the way they do while also trying to make it You know, like be able to maybe you can give me a little bit of more capacity yeah. while I do that. But why don't It is. It, it absolutely is. And basically, the countries coming together and committing is a way of saying, oops, I've created a lot of industry. Why I'm trying to clean the fuel from you? Because I, I ran out of plant. Can I plant more trees in your country? Because you still have a lot of plants. So it's like Punjab uh, or Lahore uh, going to one of the cities in Balochistan and saying, you plant this plant. Let me offset my emission by planting the trees there. And that's what Pakistan's practically trying to do right now. It's like, yes, we are. There is a lot of pollution. Let us plant more and try to capture more carbon and sequester more carbon back in the ground to reduce it in the atmosphere. Um, 
Um, and, and you're right, it, it comes back to priorities, but, but sometimes, you know, and, and I give this example to people a lot, sometimes doing enough is also not enough. Um, so when, for example, India, when they conserve their wildlife population, they preserve the forests. The fact that we've already reached these points and the forests were dry and the forests still got to fire last year is an indication that, you know, we need to do more. And, and I don't know, like, there's so much damage has already been caused that if we don't wake up now, um, like, if the IPCC reports don't wake us up, if these researchers don't wake us up, if this data doesn't wake us up, I don't know what to do. And of course, the, the steps will have to come top down. An individual one has in practically do very little. But I, I still think we have a chance. Like, I think this class means forty forms, right? Conversion of forty forms is still a big thing. Which which with the then eventually I think it's governments, international governments, it's how we want to do. And there's a whole bargain trading system, which if I have time, I'll talk about it. Because I'm not an economist, I don't think I'm going to talk about it anyway. But I will mention it uh, of how these systems, these markets have been created, where an emitter is paying a developing country for emitting this, you know, just to offset. So it's like I pay you more money because I'm throwing more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I think that is that deep root part of that process. Oh, too many questions. Can I quickly just scroll through some of the slides and part of your questions will come back? Okay. All right. So for sulfur uh, and sulfur dioxide, again, it's, it's nothing new, it's the same story that we are uh, using them, uh, they are related to this. This is a picture I used last time as well. Um, it's about uh, what acid drain did to that. And acid drain essentially is uh, the deposition of acid. So remember I said the soxes and noxes came from sulfuric acid, nitric acid, or nitrous acid, and that can dry deposit as a as a dry deposition, or it can come back with rain. And because it is acidic in nature, it will corrode the surfaces. It will impact the light. Um, so this, this discussion will also come uh, surface several time. Back to the discussion of ozone. There are health hazards associated to it on troposphere. So while ozone is good ozone, and is very, very important for the health of the planet and stratosphere, so much so that we call stratospheric ozonosphere, it is very bad for us in the of the troposphere because it impacts our health. Quickly, we will also go to uh, volatile organic compounds. I'd like to talk about methane, which is another greenhouse gas, and it's 80 times, look, 20 times more effective because it uh, can hold more, um, more, or more warmth. So it absorbs more heat. So that I think makes it way more interesting than carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is often used as an indication of, of climate change. So there, there are a few other examples, and then again, if you look at it, their sources are all very similar. Um, and and they're both natural and anthropogenic in nature. So just a reminder that every pollution that we talk about, the natural sources of it, and there are. Um, anthropogenic sources of it, and it's just that imbalance that we have to deal with. Again, a news that I looked at yesterday was that methane was observed, and this is an article from the Hindustan Times, I think, that showed that there was a plume of methane gas over Lahore. Um, and um, it said that, um, you know, it's, it's of course not healthy because it means that the, the city that, that's already too long. Use of uh, methane just lying around the atmosphere and absorbing more heat. And then I don't know what that's going to look like for the city. But Lahore has apparently a lot of these in the article that was asked to do with a lot of these uh, emission like hotspot zones. And this particular zone was related to the Lahore um, downside. So when we talk about solid waste, we also look at how solid waste is contributing to methane gas emission because. No, all those organics are uh, degrading are responsible for most of the methane in the air. So just a heads up that you know all these problems you're talking about, uh, they're very close to home. 
Uh, now we're going to come to uh, the uh, smog, um, smog discussion. I think uh, particulates, which are suspended particulate matter, are very fine particles that remain suspended in the atmosphere because they do not come down due to gravity. Okay, and um, they're also called like aerosols because they so just the, these words are interchangeable. Uh, whether you call it particulate matter, suspended particulate matter, and then you in the winter, students smoke this and they're telling you to wear one of those finer masks because they say it's effective to 2.5 microns um, and only stops these, the uh, fine microns. So, uh, just like things to remember that there's a scale there as well. Yes. So, if you are in touch with Dr. Kalplus, that is in terms of SPM. That's in terms of SPM, yeah. So, but, but mostly in terms of uh, visibility, I think we'll talk about that as well. Um, but this essentially defines, defines that. Um, again, hazardous because it actually contains some of those air pollutants that we talked about, and most of it is natural. So again, our contribution is lower than natural, but it's, it is significant enough to impact uh, our life on this planet. So let's come to smog in Lahore. But before we come to smog in Lahore, let's also look at how smog is actually formed. Um, it's one of these compounds that, that exist, for example, methane, acetone, ethanol, as some of these alcohols that remain suspended in the atmosphere. Then, then for example, the noxes. And, and remember we said that the heat or the extra sunlight and UV radiations that trigger uh, this, this reaction. So that calls for the oxygen on the top of the to be converted into ozone. Uh, so ozone actually is one of the uh, secondary pollutants. So these are the primary pollutants, these are the secondary pollutants. So these secondary pollutants contain are or uh, make the smog. So smog isn't just and smoke could be as simple as dust particles, right? Uh, but it essentially is uh, smoke plus water. So the water droplets reacting with the smoke that you generally see around. So when they react together, they're called smoke. And that smoke doesn't just contain the smoke, that smoke can actually contain a lot of heat. Now, if you look at its contribution in the work, its biggest contributor actually was vehicle, vehicular emission. I think followed by the rice burning in, in that particular season where smog happens, and then the stacks, of course, so brick kilns were highlighted, like they were shut down, um, and then they got students. So it's not just one particular source, all of these sources combine, and of course, some of the natural sources were well, like you can't, you can't like that. So all of that contributed together and form to the first one that we get to see every winter here. Let me see how far we are we get to take the question. Uh, okay, maybe let's just discuss this and then we will ask up to the questions. I'll not talk about time change today, I'll talk about it in the next class. Um, so indoor air pollution is the uh, all of these pollutants that are, that are now lying inside. So for example, if this table is painted, and the paint had one of the volatile organic compounds that isn't good for my health. And I am sitting here. That smell practically contains those pollutants. And if I'm breathing it here, uh, it's actually an indoor air pollution there. A lot of uh, the books also mention, for example, um, some of the pollutants that come with, with packaging. For example, styling is something find in the forms of the art. Fungi is something that you can find in the forms of the art. God forbid if there's like someone who's infected with, with a particular disease, that disease or those droplets are now in your And because you, you may not have been exposed to it if you weren't sitting next to me, but now because you're sitting next to me, your indoor air is composed of that part, that bacteria, that virus. Okay. So that's now your indoor Evolution. It could be chemical in nature and it could be biological in nature. And most of it comes from this stuff that we use. Whether that's carpet, 
So the first time I was told about, you know, for example, the dust that comes out of a product and what it would take. The first time I was told about using a tissue long term and then for that issue to be a source of um, your mask, the mask that um, could contain particles that are made of plastic and fabric is now a source of endoeffect if it remains in this air. Right? So our indoor air is also evolving. And, and we also talked about some of the pollutants that are outdoor air. So those pollutants are outdoor air pollutants, but they could become indoor air pollutants. So for example, um, you know, in my part of the world, we, we burn woods. So if there was incomplete to mushroom woods, carbon monoxide could build up in the monoxide. I think I have given that, that, that example. But, but one of my most favorites is cigarette. Um, and that is why I make sure, and we'll talk about it in one of the following classes, is, you know, if you're sitting with someone and, and the idea of basic smoking, we'll discuss it later, but just that one thing with seems, you know, relatively harmless compared to what the industry is doing. But just because of the fact that if you sit in a room and someone's smoking and that air now pervades, everything that is released from the smoke and impacts you is an indoor air thing that you can avoid by getting the person to either step out of the room or, you know, or for you to step out or getting them to stop smoking inside. Because this is now our reality. And last time I said it as well, now, of course, it's changed, but most of us were just stuck with our, our skills inside of our rooms. And people now say that indoor air pollution is impacting more uh, than, than our air 